message as well. Bless him and bless him abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm hoping that the video that uh, I get a copy of will maybe get me some invitations to some conferences in the States as well. <laughs> <laughs> Be nice, be nice to be a prophet in my own home for a change. Uh, I, re- I really appreciate the chance to be here. I, I, I'm absolutely challenged as I see this clock right in front of me to try to share what is for me an incredibly exciting frontier of what God is doing in the world through what people call business as mission or kingdom business or marketplace ministry or one horrible name I heard put on this was holistic entrepreneurialism. Uh, so I don't know, Derek, no marketer came up with that idea. But the, the, the idea that God is doing something profound in the marketplaces of the world is something that I have sold my life to under Christ. Uh, let me take just a couple of minutes and give you a little background on who I am so you'll know uh, some of, of why I feel the way I do about this. I was, I was converted in college. Um, I was uh, a week later planning a church, did not know that. I refer to myself as the accidental church planter. But uh, four other guys and myself began to meet, and the next thing we knew, there was a congregation on the college campus. And so I consider myself to have been born again into ministry. And so for 15 years after that, I was pastoring churches around the U.S., mainly as a church planter, and at a certain point in time, uh, as all entrepreneurs, I get bored and I would turn them over to somebody else and go plant a new one. And uh, after about 15 years of that, I began to wrestle with the question of, of A, doing it for pay, and this is not any shot anybody who does. The workman is worthy of his hire. I have no question about that. This was a personal thing, but for me, I wanted to preach the word because I love God alone, period, not because it was my, my professional position. But also, and even more importantly, I, I found myself feeling isolated from the lost. And I don't know about you, but I have a, I, let me just, true confessions, I don't like church people. I really don't. I love Christians. But have you ever noticed how just weird we get when we come together in a church? It's just, why are we like that? I don't like church people. And I found myself in this sort of church ghetto, isolated from the lost. I love the lost. I love to be with people who don't know Christ. And they know they don't know Christ. And, and they, it, maybe they have no interest in knowing Christ. That's who I want to be with. And so I found, for me, my pastoral role was actually a barrier rather than a bridge to having relation, meaningful relationships with lost people. And so I wrestled through that, and over a period of time, God began to lead me out of the formal pastorate and into business. Uh, it was interesting. Lawrence and I were talking last night. He's gone through the same transition just recently, and, and you find that your compatriots in the ministry world figure that you've, you've lost your faith. They figure that somehow you've forsaken the way. In, in reality, you're following God, but it's just such a different path to follow. And I found instantly, and over the next 10 years after that, I found what I had wanted, and that was a, my heart's desire to have interpersonal relationships with the lost as one business person to another. And the doors that opened for sharing the gospel were absolutely profound. My favorite story is a fellow uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, uh, Canada, and he, we were, I was up there teaching a class, we have at least one engineer here, on statistical process control. Uh, believe me, it's more exciting than prophecy. Really, it's incredible <laughs> as, a, as a topic. And at the end of the day, Tommy Suttles came up to me and he said, I need to have dinner with you tonight. And I said, well, that's fine, of course. Why? And he looked at me and he said, because you know God and I don't. And, of course, I'm trying to figure out what part of uh, statistical process control revealed. I don't you quote Bible verses all day long. But something in that connection had, had, had resonated in his heart, and he wanted to ask me about the hope that lies within me. That's, that was my dream come true. And that night I was able to share the gospel with Tommy Suttles, a hopeless alcoholic uh, in Regina, Saskatchewan. And, and it, was, it was just the, sort of the confirmation of this is what I love to do. And I'm not an evangelist, by the way. I'm not a, one of those strong interpersonal gospel communicators. I'm really not. I'm more of a teacher pastor in my gifting, but that was my desire. Well, after about 10 years of that, I began to go through another period of questioning, and that was built around, okay, Lord, I've got 15 years of pastoral experience, theological training, all that goes with that. Now I've got 10 years of business experience. How do these things fit together? I wasn't just content to be a Christian in the marketplace. Uh, I was listening to you when you said I'm just an, just an assistant or just an administrative assistant. I thought, I agree with you. There's no just, right? That's a great calling. But I kind of felt that way. I'm just a business guy. And I said, I'm asking the Lord, say, okay, what now? And I was led over to Kyrgyzstan, the, the newly independent republic of Kyrgyzstan back in the early 90s, former Soviet republic. 
And uh, I was asked to teach at the State Medical Institute, and there uh, I discovered the, the doors that open through business for the gospel in closed countries. Kyrgyzstan is a, is a, a Muslim country, 5 million Muslims. Uh, at that point in time, there were maybe 150 believers in the country. And here I am, an openly Christian individual. And I am, I'm filling up auditoriums everywhere I go because they are so hungry to hear about business. And in that context, Muslims are asking me about Christ. Why are you here? Well, I'm here because God loves me and God loves you. He wants me to communicate that to you through business. And they're eating it up, kind of like what you were doing with your eggs Benedict a minute ago. They're just, just, and so uh, there was a revelation of, of what has been termed business as mission, but it really all it meant was, and, 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 and what I've been living for the last 20 years or seeking to really explore, is this idea of, of how God takes your life and integrates it under the lordship of Christ, so there is no sacred secular, there's no, um, there's no holy over here and unholy over here, but, but business as a calling, a high and holy calling in which Jesus Christ is glorified, whether it's downtown or what you guys call CBD Brisbane. Uh, I've got to, got to learn the two things I'm having to learn here, by the way. I'm having to learn CBD versus downtown, and have, I have to learn to get in the correct side of the car. <laughs> that is really a struggle for me. I've gotten in my driver's seat more often than I should. But how, whether it's there or whether it's Indonesia or whether it's Kyrgyzstan or whether it's Brazil or wherever you happen to go in the world, how God is, is, is just opening up this frontier of business people on the very front lines. I was talking with Michael earlier. I, I feel the exact same way about government. Now, I'm not in government. Uh, I may be someday. I don't know. But uh, I'm not currently. But the same thing of how God integrates our life under the lordship of Christ so that business, government, ministry in the church, whatever it happens to be, what really matters is, am I living out the high and holy calling that God has on my life? Or am I locked into this sort of hierarchical belief system that there are called and uncalled? You know what I'm talking about, right? There are those called to ministry and then there's the rest of us. Or, we're, yes, we're all called, but are we all called high holy callings? The answer is yes. And once we begin to break through that, the rest of this makes perfect sense. So in the little bit of time I've got with you this morning, I want to fly through some slides from my assistant. We have worked endless hours to get this timing just right. Uh, and, and so uh, hopefully it will flow out the way it's supposed to. But I want to share at least some provocative thoughts, at least some ideas of, of what I've learned in my journey as God has led me through this business, this mission thing. Uh, I shared yesterday at Christian Heritage College that we're all explorers. Uh, I really, there's no expert here. Anybody that would claim to be an expert is, is really a, a fool. Uh, we're just learning. And I have no doubt that there are people in this room and every other group I ever address that are going to take this movement farther than I would ever dream of taking it because God is doing something that, that I believe is going to change the face of, of countries, not just of individuals, but of, but of cities and of countries. And it's going to be the gospel flowing to communities trans, in a transformational way through business. So let me share just a few ideas with you, and Christine has got it all set up here. A few questions that I want to ask you very quickly. What do we mean by business as mission? Why would we do it? What's the point of it all? And then a few thoughts on the early stages of how. And so as we go through that, we'll see if this makes some sense to you. Uh, when we talk about business as mission, let me, let me tell you quickly what I think it's not. Uh, and, and I won't read the whole list to you. You're intelligent people, and I think that's always insulting when a, when a presenter reads a list from you in his PowerPoint presentation. But let me make a couple of points that I think are critical here. When we talk about business as mission, can we say, first of all, we're not talking about justifying our careers because we salt it with the gospel. If we believe inside, in our hearts, that business is somehow a necessary evil, at best... It's, it's a neutral, but it's not a good thing from God, that it's not something that God instituted for His own glory. If somehow we believe that, then everything we do in trying to integrate our faith <clears throat> into, the, into our business life is going to be an attempt to justify it. You know what I'm saying? We feel guilty for being in business. We feel guilty for making money. We feel guilty for being successful. So we're going to gild it. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to put some gold over it, and so we're going to put a fish on our business card, or we're going to uh, have a prayer meeting before our board uh, meets, and so we're going to put these little Christian, what would you call them, accessories around our business, and that makes it okay. Well, a good friend of mine in the States said one time, business needs no justification. Do you, do you justify the fact that you're a father? Bruce gets up. I love the way you did that, brother. 
Bruce gets up and says, let me tell you what matters to me. I've been married for 25 years, and I'm the father of four boys, and we're going to have a prayer session for you after this. <laughs> it's like raising a herd of buffaloes, isn't it? Um, but, but, but right, does he make any apology for being a father and a husband? You know, he feels no guilt for that. He feels no need to justify that. Uh, if somebody is in the pastorate, Ian gets up, introduces himself as the pastor of a Baptist church on the south side. Does he feel... <laughs> well, and and, and be, be warm and be fed, my brother. Um, but but isn't, isn't that... I mean, there, he feels no need to justify that. But the rest of us... <laughs> but the rest of us might feel that way. And so when we talk about business as a mission, we're not talking about justifying the calling that God has on our life. We need to celebrate that calling. If you're in government, as Michael is, if you're a teacher, uh, if, if, if you are a family person, whatever it is, we need to learn to celebrate the calling. That's the freedom that everything else flows from. So that's the first thing I'd tell you, business as mission is not. Secondly, and really the last point up here, it's not making nice at work. I love that. Oh, we're just going to be nice to each other. Really? Well, let's just all hug at the end of the day. That's not Christianity. In the States, we have a song we talk about kumbaya, right? It refers to being around the campfire. It's a very emotional moment. At the end of the day, big hug. That's, that's not the gospel. But we think, okay, I'll just be a really nice person at work. And that, that way, I, I'm, it's okay. Well, that's not business's mission. I don't know what that is, but it's not business as mission. Let me give you a working definition of business as mission. And she's good. You notice this? I'm not even having to. She's really good. You're going with me. (laughs) Uh, But but here's what I want you to think about. All business as mission is, and you can fill in anything you want, by the way. It could be government as mission, life as mission, teaching as mission, health care as mission, although I don't think you want to be a part of the ham movement. But if you just fill it in, fill in the blank. It's nothing more than the natural extension of your faith into the place where God has called you. That's all it is. It's not any great effort. It's not some program. It's not some ten-step thing that you have to do. It's not this horrendous strategy you've got to figure out. It's really nothing more complicated than recognizing that as a new creature in Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, I have within me this treasure. You know, I'm, I'm an earthen vessel. I'm a cracked pot, as one person said. But within me is the living Christ. And my relationship with Him, I simply allow that. It's natural to allow that to enter every place and every relationship that He brings my way. And you say, well, yeah, I get that. That's business as mission. It's just recognizing that as you walk into the workplace, as Wes just said, you walk into the workplace where you have the privilege of sitting next to dozens of people who have not, no knowledge of Christ whatsoever, and you are walking in with Christ. And I'm not suggesting that you have to then become the evangelist with your big fat Bible in one arm and your hand raised in the other and proclaim the gospel. You simply have to demonstrate it. And you get the privilege of taking the gospel to the people who need it most every single day. And that's in the marketplace or that's overseas. That's all it is at a working level. So we'll sit there and work through this. If you can kind of zero in on this, this is my... my model. And I think it's just, it's it's trying to express something I think is the, the crux of the matter. We live in a disintegrated world. We are disintegrated people. We are fragmented. And even Christians, while we've been regenerated in our spirits, we still live in a fragmented sort of life. So we have our church life, and we have our family life, and we have our business life, and we've got all these various boxes and compartments and headings. And the further we move, I think, to the, yeah, to the left on this, the more disintegrated we become, the weirder our attempt to live for Christ is. Have you ever anybody walk up to you and say, Wes, how's your Christian life going? And people say that to me, and I want to say, as opposed to what? My pagan life? I mean, what other life do I have? It's not a Christian life and my business life, and it's my life in Christ. And so this disintegrated thinking leads us to a, a, a very, very weird place. For example... Uh, I, I was talking with Pete Kentley the other day. He's added a fifth one. I'm going to go back and have to adjust this. Over here on the very far left are the people he calls the survivors. How's it going at work? Surviving. Surviving. You hear that? Right? You hear that from people. Sometimes you may feel that way. I'm just surviving. Well, that's a horrible way to go through life. I am surviving. And at the end of it all, that's what I want on my tombstone. He survived. That's kind of oxymoronic, by the way, isn't it, to have that on your tombstone? My mother always says on her tombstone it will say, I told you I was sick. (laughs) 
I think that's a much better way of doing it. But then, then, as you, then you have the group over here I call the separationists. And these are the people that view everything about life outside the church as evil. And so they're going to go out there for only as long as they can stand it. It's like being a, a scuba diver. They're going to fill up their tanks of oxygen on Sunday. They're going to deep dive into the, the cesspool of the world on Monday. And hopefully they'll have enough oxygen to last uh, throughout the week. And so since they don't, they end up with a service on Monday morning and, a, and, a, and something on Monday night. And so suddenly church becomes their life and everything else they're separate from. I call that a Christian ghetto. Uh, there's the invaders. These are my, these are my favorites. They, they go out, uh, we call them in the States, the Tuesday evening muggers, right, where they go out and they tell you with a you know, very forceful way how much Jesus loves you, try to persuade you to accept Christ, and drag you kicking and screaming back to the fortress of faith, claiming a convert for Christ. Of course, the big question is where are those people you know, a year later or five years later? Something very, very wrong with this invader mentality. Then the overlayers, and I'm, I know I'm going to offend somebody with this, but the overlayers are the people who have a fish on their business card. Now, I'm sure some of you do, and, and, and that's fine. Uh, if you do, that's, you just better live up to it. But let me tell you my pet peeve. Please, don't put a fish on your car. No one in Brisbane is spiritual enough to have a fish on their car. I've seen how you drive. You drive on the wrong side of the road, for Pete's sake. That's the first part. But I really, in all seriousness, who is it that cuts you off in traffic? Invariably, it's that person with a fish on their, on their car. <laughs> These are the overlayers. They're the ones who are going to put Christian symbols to try to make it seem Christian. And then there are people who finally begin to explore the reality of integration. That my life is not compartmentalized. It's not fragmented. It's not disintegrated. It is integrated. It's reintegrated into one life lived under the lordship of Christ and to the glory of God. And so as you think through business and mission, that's the theoretical platform. And you need a little bit of that. We need to think correctly. Daryl Miller says uh, very profoundly, very simply, thoughts have consequences. And if we don't think rightly about business and our role in it, it's going to have consequences in our ability to live for Christ and impact our co-workers for the gospel. So think rightly. Let's move on and we'll give you some more practical stuff. Why do we do this? Why does this even matter? Well, here's the very simple answer to that. What is God up to in the world? What is his purpose in the world? And if you want to look up these scriptures later, uh, or if you'd like a copy of this slideshow, you're welcome to it. It's not, certainly not proprietary. If you, if you look at these scriptures, you will find that from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, God is really about one thing. And that is filling up the earth with worshipers. Filling up the earth with people who know and honor and, and worship Him. Well, if that's His purpose, doesn't it make sense that that ought to be my purpose? And as Michael was challenging, challenging, challenging us, and I, this is so good about a politician because he didn't know he was going to get asked to speak, and he walks up, and it, it, you'd think that was prepared remarks. It was just so quick. But, but it was so also appropriate. What is your mission? What is your purpose? Have you written it down as an individual? Well, it ought to be somehow tied to what God is doing. Don't you think? As a believer who surrendered his life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, how can I have a vision that's other than his? How can I have a purpose that's other than his? And so my life purpose ultimately is to participate with God in what he's doing, filling up the earth with worshipers. Now, I would tell you take that a step farther in business's mission, and if you have the privilege of owning your business, Write a mission statement that embraces that. What is the direct intentional connection of your business to what God is doing in the world? That's why we work among the Muslims in about 20 different countries because my gift is starting things. Lately, it's been starting businesses. It used to be starting churches. And so connecting my giftedness to what God is doing in the world has led us to start about 650 businesses in Muslim countries that are platforms for the communication of the Gospels. They're not visa platforms. They're platforms for the, for the communication of Jesus Christ and His love to the people of Islam. And we all ought to be able to wrestle through that. One of my big challenges to business people is to wrestle through the connection of God's purpose in your business. And until you're clear on that, and, and by the way, I'm not totally clear on it myself. It's a process. But until you're becoming more clear on that, you won't understand what business is mission is about. That's, the, that's one of the greatest questions any believer can ever ask. What is it that God has purposed for this business to bring to his kingdom? You don't just have a, a business because it's a way to make money. It is that, and that's a good thing. But you have a business to be connected to what God is doing in the world. Right? So how do, we, how do we actually make, we'll move on past this one, how do we actually make this happen? Well, let me give you the ultimate goal. And this is a model just to think about. 
call it societal transformation. I love that term. Uh, here's my prejudice on this. If you read the Great Commission, if you ever read it as Jesus telling us to go out and win souls, it doesn't make any sense. If you read it as going out and plant churches, it doesn't really make any sense. And here's why I say that. It begins with, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And it ends with, I, the one with all authority on heaven and earth, am with you always. So what comes in between must be pretty profound to require that kind of parameter, that kind of parenthesis to say, I'm going to ask you to do something that is so incredibly huge and humanly impossible that without me, the Lord of all, with you every moment, it isn't going to happen. And we don't think soul winning is that. Now, don't get me wrong. Theologically, I can't win a soul. I know I can't regenerate anybody. But we don't think sharing the gospel is that hard. And we don't think planting churches is that hard. But if you go back and ask what Jesus told us to do, which is disciple the nations, of which evangelism is a part, and church planting is a part, but it's so much grander than that, then you suddenly find yourself saying, Lord, I am so glad that you told me you were with me because this is impossible, right? So let's think about what that might look like. Four pillars society is built on. Family, and some will say seven, and some will say ten, and however. Uh, some will say, but I believe family, government, academia, and enterprise crumbled through the fall. Would you agree? All right? The family's broken. Government's corrupt, academia is godless, and business is greedy. It's all crumbled, and as a result, society is crumbled. Well, you don't fix society, you fix the pillars. And the way you fix the pillars is you go back into those pillars and you redeem them. And so when you as a business person are, are redeeming the enterprise pillar, what happens? You find that you are, are beginning to rebuild society. As a, as a father, when you're discipling your children, you are doing your part of redeeming society. As a, as a member of parliament, you, you're re helping to redeem that aspect of God's institutions. And beneath all of this is the church, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. See, the role of the church is not to be this little enclave off to the side. The role of the church is to be able to, to equip those who are out here living their ministry in all of these battlefields. And, when, and when, the, when the pastorate and the church does that well, it's a powerful, powerful thing. And that is what I believe that God is about. Well, all right, that's, that's up here. Let's come down very quickly as we start wrapping up with some very practical things I th I'd ask you to think about. I think about five, I call them buckets, five buckets of ba BAM strategy. And there's, this is why you'll say I'm just getting started because there's probably 500 buckets or 500,000 buckets. There's a, something amazing about our Creator God inspiring us to create new ways to reach people with the gospel. But there are at least five to think of. And so as you go through these, think about the idea of what, will, and these are in no order of priority. Marketplace ministry is you and the person next to you. That's, that's the CEO at work. That's the vice president and his team. That is the marketing manager and her staff. That is the, the, the person sitting in one cubicle who is loving the person in the next cubicle. That's marketplace ministry, and we've got to take that back. We've got to stop thinking we're going to invite these people to church. We've got to live it there. That is the closest to home calling that we could have. Then you can think about what some people are calling OPE, overseas private equity. That's where a company of substantial size lands an office, lands a, a, a business in another place, another part of the country, another part of the world. I know an engineering firm in Atlanta that did this uh, where they planted an office in, um, not Ankara, but in a, in a Turkish city. Uh, uh, it'll come to me. But anyway, their purpose was to do engineering. But in the context of that, they were witnessing to Turkish Muslims every single day. And it was accepted because they were bringing value. OPE is a huge opportunity. People are terrified of it. Wes and, and, and Pam did tent making. And it's interesting, tent making got a bad name over the last 20 years because we would hear these kinds of things. Well, I'd love to go be a tent maker, but I have to work so much I don't have time for my ministry. Now think about that for a second. What kind of thinking is that? That's disintegrated thinking. I have to work so much I don't have time for my ministry. Who are you working with? Who's sitting across the desk from you? Who's across the counter from you? A Muslim or a Hindu or an atheist or a Scientologist or whatever. You lay them in there. And that's, that tent making is nothing more than being with the people you need to be with. I mean, we call it tent making because theoretically that's what Paul did occasionally. But it really is just going and working in a foreign culture. 
and watching what God will do. I was having dinner last night, and Wes is sharing some of the stories about what God did with him and Pam and others in, in Saudi Arabia, the most closed country on the face of the earth. And he's right in the middle of it, having a time of his life. Then there is what we do. Our business is microenterprise development. That our gift is helping people start businesses. So we've made a business out of starting businesses. And we will go into countries like Indonesia or Mongolia or Nepal or Tibet or whatever, and we will help believers start businesses that they can use to support their local church, and the local church begins to take on its own national ministry, its own uh, national missions program, which makes perfect sense because they can, as Ian and I were talking about, we don't look like, walk like, talk like, or eat like the people that we minister to. So how much more efficient is it to equip them to do it and to give them the economic traction to do it as well? So that's what I mean by microenterprise development. And then finally, uh, there is targeted investment, and that's something that's just beginning to emerge. I'm not talking here about giving. I'm not talking about dropping money in the offering plate or the missions fund as it goes by. I'm talking about business people investing in businesses overseas. That, there's a gigantic need in the businesses mission movement for worthy investments and worthy investors. It's a huge need. And I would encourage you to think about that as well as to could we form, for example, an Australian capital fund that was a business that would make money, would make a return for the investors, and at the same time invest in worthy kingdom business in places like uh, Myanmar or China or places that are unreached. Those are the basic buckets of BAM. Well, let me just wrap up with this by telling you that uh, we are only on the edge. I've heard this recently described as the Second Reformation. I'm a little scared of that. Uh, there's a lot of hubris <laughs> with that kind of... Uh, uh, language. I don't, I don't think Luther thought of himself as having the first, so I'm a little scared that we would think of ourselves as having the second. But I do know this. This is a global movement. This is not an Australian movement. It's not an American movement. It's not a European movement. This is everywhere, and it is popping up all over the planet. That's why I'm encouraged. It's not being coordinated by any central committee. Uh, there's no one group of people, BAM International, that's doing this. It's everywhere. And, and that tells me that God is in it. And I believe that we're going to see in the 21st century a wave that transforms our countries, and they need transforming, but also transforms those places where the gospel is barely planted. So let me leave you with, at least at the presentation side, we'll go to Q&A, but let me leave you with this challenge. I don't know what BAM will mean for you or kingdom business or whatever you want to call it, but I would ask you to... to, to begin to learn, begin to explore. Partner up with people like Wes and others that are doing this to figure out what is it that God is saying to me in this. And it may be something so much more profound than what he's ever said to me. Wow, that's wonderful. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I do or you do, it's what God does through us. But he's only going to work through us if we're, if we're willing to be worked through. And so I'm excited. And I, I really appreciate the chance just to share for a few minutes with you all this morning about that. So let me... Uh, let me stop. And Wes, how do you, you want to facilitate this? Or? Just superb. <laughs> how else do you describe that? But uh, we want to make sure we have some time for questions this morning. So does anyone have some questions of Mike? Jeanette? In China? Yes. Uh, we've worked with several companies over there. Uh, uh, are we still on tape? Yeah, okay. We have several companies in different locations uh, where we have, they're, they're, they're <laughs> fairly, fairly, large, fairly large companies that we've been working with the senior management teams to help them implement um, disciple making within their business context. Yeah, and, there, and I will tell you, there is a massive business as mission movement going on in China right now. Massive. Yes, sir. No, we only do it in partnership. Ian. And as a matter of fact, we're all what we represent is a, a network of business volunteers, really, who see this as their calling. And we partner with typically an expat missionary who's working in a, in a restricted access area who knows that business is mission or business development or some form of kingdom business is going to be helpful and accretive to their strategy. And so if they invite us in and we believe that it's a good mix as a partnership, then we'll work together. And as I was sharing with Wes on the way in, we, we go in under the authority of that missionary. Uh, one of the things I think is, is really critical, and we've got to think through this as believers, is the partnership between church, mission agency, and business community. 
And that's, we're trying to live that. We're not perfect at it, but we're trying to live that. So we do it always in partnership. Pioneers, for example, is a really good partner of ours. I would love to talk about some partnerships with CCI somewhere, you know, what Jason's doing. So, there, yes, it's, it's in part. I think it has to be. I think that's the, 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 one of the principles of the kingdom. Mick? I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Uh, we started in Nepal about six years ago, and uh, we've since turned it over uh, to Nepali Control, and so they have uh, their own bank, their own capital fund, and their own trainers. And uh, thank you. And so it was been, it's been really fantastic. It's a, it's a, it, the church in Nepal, it's interesting, I'll tell you, the church in Nepal is fairly, it's growing, but the real power, if you want to see a group of people where God is at work, is the Tibetan refugees. Uh, the Lomi and other, other Tibetan tribes coming out and down off the Tibetan Plateau in the Mustang Valley. Uh, and, and I will tell you this, they are the best business people on the planet. Never negotiate with a Tibetan. <laughs> Just give them what they ask for because you're going to end up there anyway. So, But yeah, Nepal is right for this kind of thing. Yeah, I that. Did you? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, great question. And, and let me, uh, it's, it's probably only fair to you since you don't really know me. I'm, I'm, I, have, I have a family motto, often wrong, never silent. Uh, so you have, to, <laughs> you, you have to take some of what I say with a little bit of a grain of salt. And I'm also the, sort of the master of overstatement. Um, so I don't really care if you have a fish on your business card or if you, if you mention or you, you write your public mission statement around the gospel. That's totally fine. Uh, it just, to me, if we're doing that and thinking that is Christianity, then we're wrong. But to do it is perfectly fine. A mission statement, as Michael pointed out, we all know this in business, is, is nothing more than the artic- articulation of the purpose uh, of your company. And so how could you write that if you're, if you're an integrated business? How could you write it and not? In our, in our company, what we talk, our mission statement says that we exist to support uh, indigenous church planting among the peoples of the 1040 window through the seamless integration of business as mission. So we're, we're doing it. It's right there in the middle of our, sta- in our mission statement, and it keeps, us, it keeps us focused. How do you feel about having to deal with Yeah, it, it, it can it can work against you. <clears throat> yeah, it it can it can make a difference. I mean, yeah, there are people who won't do business with you if you're openly Christian. Uh, I I do think that there's a difference between being openly Christian and one of my new favorite words, obstreperously Christian, which means unnecessarily difficult, right? <laughs> and so some of us some of us think we're being persecuted for the gospel when we're really just being persecuted for being obnoxious, and that's what you have to watch out for. <laughs> but yeah, you you know, I mean, there's no right answer for that. At the, at the, at the end of the day. <laughs> so, sorry, Wes. It's so true. Um, but but at the end of the day, you've got to figure out what's right for you. That's part of the that's part of the beauty of this thing, you know. Ours, we're openly Christian. Now, I, I'm part of another company. I'm part of five different companies, and one of the companies we have our value statements, and there's nothing Christian in it at all because I'm the only Christian on the senior management team uh, so far, and uh, so I'm not done there yet. But the um, uh, so there we talk about values: honesty, integrity, maturity, family first, and passion. But in you know, but all of that is consistent with scripture. So you really have to figure that out almost individually. That's a great question. One more. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we we started in the former Soviet Republic of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we spread quickly up into Kazakhstan, into uh, southern Russia, Chechnya. Uh, and, the, and the provinces on either side of uh, Chechnya. And uh, uh, it's, it's been really, really interesting. Just a quick um, overview of that. The Soviet Union is, a uh, former Soviet Union, is, a, is a, uh, an amazingly complex place. There's a, God is doing some tremendous things there. Uh, churches are popping up everywhere. Uh, the persecution is intense, and it's getting more intense. Uh, corruption is a way of life. Uh, it may, it's very difficult to do business there at all, much less to do it in a Christian, biblical, ethical way. Uh, and yet there are people there we've been able to work with. We've got about 35 businesses in Russia, Russia proper, uh, where they've been able to live for Christ, make a difference for Christ. Uh, it is possible. 
So yes, things are happening there. Uh, but uh, Russia, I will tell you, pray for Russia. Russia is a, very much at a crossroads. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very worried about Putin's re-election, which is almost a sure thing right now. Uh, and uh, his, his, his nationalism, I think, is moving to a place of danger for the West. And so uh, that will mean danger for the church. So I would encourage you very much to pray. Uh, the biggest issue for the church in Russia is not persecution, it's unity. It's the most divided church I've ever seen, you know, much more so than here or in the States. So, yeah, please pray for that. Thank you. Wes, thank you, thank you brother. Much. Appreciate it. Thank you all. God bless.